G'day and welcome to Space Engineers. In this tutorial series, I'm gonna go through everything you need to know to get from knowing nothing about survival to being able to build pretty much whatever you want and going nuts with the awesome mechanics in Space Engineers. When you first load up the game, I would strongly suggest going to new game and starting with the first jump. This is a scripted, semi-storyline-esque scenario that'll give you everything from basic controls through to how do you pick up tools, how to put them in your hotbar, that sort of thing. If you get stuck anywhere along the way there, if you've made it to the moon, you should be fine to then jump across to this tutorial series and run with it from there. The learning to survive scenario is quite a good tutorial on the game mechanics within Space Engineers, much as the first jump scenario is a tutorial on the actual controls within Space Engineers. I recommend giving it a go, but if you get stuck, don't get frustrated, just leave it be and jump over to survival as I will guide you through how you can do everything within survival and then you can come back and actually have some big fun with this scenario because there's quite a difficult challenge at the end. So it should be fun to come back to whenever you feel like it. To start out in survival, jump across to custom game and we're going to ignore all of these ones at the top of the list. They all start with different conditions and most of them start with lots and lots of materials. The more common starting condition that you'll see people use is the star system. We're gonna run with 100% default. I'm not gonna change any of these settings. The only one that you might change is your online mode in case you're wanting to start learning with a friend so that they can join you in your game. For now, let's press start. When the game starts up, you'll be met with this spawning menu. You can choose from a bunch of different pods. For now, we're gonna choose the Earth-like drop pod because there are a couple of layers of difficulty that we won't have to deal with initially, but that we can introduce as we get more experienced. So let's click on that one. You can either double click on it or click respawn. You'll spawn in in a drop pod just like this one. If you press V, we can see the outside and you can see that we're about to land on a whole bunch of tundra with not much else around. If you're unhappy with this spawn location and you're in single player, simply hit F5 and do a quick load. That's gonna take you back to the spawn menu and you can click respawn and we'll land somewhere else randomly. As you can see here, the terrain is now quite different. And it looks like we're about to land on a tree, so let's do that one more time. Yep, into the tree we go. Hmm. While we're landing, let's take a look at the inventory aboard this ship. If we press I, we can see that in the passenger seat that I'm in, we've got a, an automatic rifle and some ammunition. I'm gonna move them across to my personal inventory, even though they take a bit of space, because I have a bad habit of grinding down that seat and destroying both of these things. If you then click on the show connected inventories, we can see what else is aboard this drop pod. In the O2H2 generator, we've got an oxygen bottle, a hydrogen bottle, and some ice. And we've got nothing in the survival kit or small cargo container, nothing in the parachute hatch. Whenever I start up a new game of Space Engineers, my aims right from the outset are always to get a source of power, to get something to assemble components and to get something to refine down ores and materials so that we can build more things. And for us right at the beginning, that's most likely going to be a basic assembler, a basic refinery and either wind turbines or solar panels. Since we're on earth and we have access to wind power, that's gonna be the better way to go we'll get more power from less resources and we'll still get power at night. One of the most important aspects to understand about space engineers is how conveyor systems work. This will allow you to move inventory around without having to manually handle it. What I've brought in here is I've cheated and I've copied in an extra version of the drop pod with a bunch of the armor and the seat removed as it'll help demonstrate what we're going to look at here. If we go around to the side here, you'll see that we've got access to our O2H2 generator, which we can access the inventory of through this yellow highlighted port on the side. You'll see the oxygen bottle and hydrogen bottle, and we can move those into our inventory from here. We can also go around to our survival kit, which has a similar port, and we can access and move the ice from there into our inventory and move it out. We can't, however, move the hydrogen bottle. And that's because Hydrogen bottles are too big to fit through the pipes that are connecting these two locks. These two pipes here, these tiny ones, they are small conveyor tubes. These are too small for most items to pass through. The simple rule to remember is that oxygen, hydrogen, ores, ice, ingots, and ammunition will pass through small and nothing else will. It's not entirely true, but as a simple rule, it will keep you out of trouble. And with that out of the way, let's move to some resource collection. 
We've got our survival kit on this side and it's going to be the thing that's processing all of the resources we collect, at least initially. So we're probably going to want to have our resource collection point nearby it. So let's dig a hole in the ground just opposite it. With drills, you have two different drilling options. You have left click, which will remove a small amount of voxel material and give you resources for that. You also have right click, which will remove a larger amount of area and will destroy anything in it. Now, I'm going to actually dig through the topsoil and get down to the rock in order to collect more materials more quickly. The drill removes a sphere of material, so if you're constantly moving forward, you should end up with a nice slope that you can walk down. So let's have a look at this difference between dirt and rock. If we left click on here, you can see, where'd that go? We just got a single piece of stone, 105. That's actually a pretty good yield from dirt. If we do it again, we get about the same or even less, 91. Now, if we do it to the rock here, same amount, we got 256, 66, 94 and 9. That is a lot quicker. So you are much better off digging down to the rock and then digging here. Even though we have to walk a bit further to get back to the drop pod, it is so much quicker to collect resources this way. To transfer our stone to the survival kit, there are a few different ways you can do it. You can click and drag and drop it in, or you can move it across with double click, which will move the maximum that can fit into the accepting inventory. And the accepting inventory is always the one at the top of the opposing column. So if I'm moving back from here, it will always move to the top here. And when you're connected to a ship, that will work the same way. We can also move in stacks. If you control click, you'll move 10 at a time. If you shift click, you'll move 100 at a time. And if you control shift, you'll move 1000. And we're about to use that again when we go to our production menu. To actually process the stone into ingots that are useful, we need to queue these up. And really, the most efficient way to do this is to queue a whole lot at a time. So let's control, shift, left click, and queue up a thousand. It's not gonna work through that many, but it means that every time we drop stone into the survival kit, it will just work through whatever we've provided it with, and it will give us iron, nickel, silicon, and gravel, which is mostly a waste product. With these ingots, we can now produce some basic components. The survival kit has a fairly limited repertoire of things it can produce, but for now we only need a few steel plate, some interior plate, and then we'll have a look at what we need to get the wind turbine up. Let's queue up five steel plate and five interior plate, and let's click back to inventory. So let's double click on each of these to bring them across to our inventory, tip the rest of the stone back in. The stone will only get processed 500 kilos at a time. If you have a look across here, you can see the required as I hover over this is 500. It goes up to a massive amount because that's the required for this side of the production queue, but we'll look into that more later. For now, let's grab our armor block from our hotbar. And if you click it multiple times, you'll switch between large and small grid. So let's go with large grid. Let's place one of these cubes in the ground and then we'll place the rest of the ones we've got on top of it until we run out. And now we've run out. We can then place our wind turbine on top and we've got the start of our base going. For the wind turbine, if we pull out our grinder or welder, you'll see what a block has in it and what it still requires. So we still need another five interior plate, eight motors, 20 construction components, 24 girders, and two computers. The 30 interior plate at the top are not strictly necessary for this to function. Let's take a look at our seat down here to explain this further. If I grind away these light armor blocks at the front, which can be a quite convenient way to get access to some more steel plate, we can then have a look at our passenger seat. This one contains 20 interior plates and 20 construction components, but you can see a functional line. And in anything that contains a computer, there will also be a hack line on there as well. If we grind this down to just above the functional line, you can see that we can still hop in, even though we have taken, whoops, even though we've taken 10 interior plates and 19 construction components out of it. So the same idea is true with this wind turbine. We don't need to have all of the components in it for it to work, but those components on top are the things that will keep it working, even if it takes a little bit of damage. Now you can see my hydrogen is down to nine, so let's refill that. Around at the side of our survival kit, we've got an access point like this. If you press F on that, you'll get power, oxygen, health, and hydrogen, as you can see there. 
There's another way to refill our suit's hydrogen. If we go around to our O2H2 generator, we can pull the hydrogen bottle out of here, pop it in our inventory, and it will automatically refill our hydrogen in our suit each time it gets low. As you can see there, it just went up to 100, and now you can see that the bottle has 89% left in it. We can then put the bottle back into the O2H2 generator and it will automatically refill using up the ice that remains. Much as the ice was being used to fill up our suit when we went to the survival kit to refill there. Having the bottle in our inventory is convenient because it will refill even while we're mid-flight, which means we can stay up there for much longer. The downside is it's a fairly large item and will take up quite a bit of space in our inventory, limiting our ability to collect things like stone and making that process take a little bit longer. But for the safety, I tend to do it that way anyway. Let's have a look at what we still need from here. We still need eight motors, 24 girders and two computers. So if we go to our survival kit, we can go to production, go to our basic components. We can queue up eight of these, 24 of these or 30 because I accidentally clicked too many times and two computers. Now we're probably going to need to collect a bit more stone. If you have a look at our required available list here, you can see that stone is huge because of this ingots we've queued up. If we remove that, we can then see just what's needed for the generation of these components. And that is we need to have 79 iron and eight nickel. If we add these back into our queue, let's go down and mine until we've got enough for those to get built. While that's processing, I wanna talk about another thing that's convenient to remember while mining. If you want to collect up all these stones that are down on the ground, you hold down F and just look around. It's also a good idea to hold down F while you're actually mining into the walls. It will collect some of the stones that pop out before they even hit the ground, saving you a bit of time. So most experienced players will tend to hold down F while hand mining. We've got a bit of a problem at the moment. We can't put the stone into the inventory of the survival kit because the survival kit's inventory is full. The reason for that is the ingots are only being processed after the materials are being, after the components are being made. We can actually reorganize this queue. You can drag things around and reorganize it and move the ingots to the front of the queue so that they get processed first. But we've got all the materials we need. Let's dump the rest of the stone and grab our girders, our motors and our computers. Let's fly up to our wind turbine and get it built. There we go. One wind turbine. So we've got a bit of a power source. Let's move on to the next stages of what we need to do. We need to build a bit of a platform so that we can place down our assembler and our refinery. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a few of the blocks of armor off this drop pod so that we can get a few resources from it rather than having to process down stone to get these steel plate. We can very safely take off quite a number of them from the drop pod without reducing its integrity. So I built a small two by three platform there and let's build a ramp so we can get up onto it. And now we can place down our assembler and our refinery. The basic assembler has only a single cargo access port. That means we're probably best placing it sideways like this and then using the refinery, which has two cargo access ports, we can place it like so. With the conveyors lined up like this, materials will be able to go straight from the refinery into the assembler We'll also be able to walk around to the end of the refinery here and access the cargo of both because they're connected. Both of these blocks are going to require a significant amount of resources. So we're gonna to have to get to mining and collecting all of those. You may be able to salvage some of the needed components from various parts around the drop pod. But for now, because I wanna use this as a vehicle in a future video, we're gonna leave it mostly intact and collect most of our resources from below the surface. Since we're not gonna be flying around while doing this mining, I'm actually gonna drop my hydrogen bottle off just so that I can carry a bit more stone with each trip. Much as we did for the turbine, we can have a look at what's needed for the basic assembler and queue that up. I don't know about you, but I struggle to remember more than three things at a time. So let's look at 60 steel plate, 40 construction components and 10 motors. Four displays and 80 computers using control click to get the tens for each of those. It's a reasonably safe rule that the last object in a list of components required that's right up the top, if it's the same as the one down the bottom, you will not need it to get that block functional. You just need it to make that block protected if, in case it takes some damage. We're rather tight on resources right now, so I won't be putting those into them just yet. And we're not gonna look at what's needed for the basic refinery because we'll get the assembler to build that for us saving some of the battery power that remains on our pod. And speaking of battery power, this is the battery around the side here. 
you can see that it's got four indicators on it. Those four lights show 100% full, greater than 75, greater than 50, and greater than 25% full. You can also see a more accurate readout if you go into your control panel, which is by, done by hopping in the seat and pressing K, or wandering around to the, one of these access ports and right clicking. We can then click on the battery and it will tell us how long it's got left. While that stone's processing and we're starting to get those components, let's have a look at another thing. If we go to our G menu, which is done by pressing G, you'll see that you've got a limited selection of blocks available to you. You've also got a progression window here. This is where we unlock a variety of different things by building blocks. There are a few blocks on board this drop pod that you can build right from the very start, and there's a convenient way to unlock things like what the landing gear unlocks. So if we walk up to this landing gear, and we grind it down below that functional line, and then weld it back up again, we get the unlock. Another convenient one to do, especially if you've actually taken stuff out of your passenger seat, is to get in here and grind down this small cargo container and weld it back up again. Now that we've done that, if we go back to our progression tree, we can see that by building the landing gear, we've unlocked all of these blocks. And by building the cargo container, we've unlocked conveyor tubes and things like that, which is very, very handy to unlock early. And that's by far the easiest way to unlock it. Your first day in Space Engineers will be spent with a lot of mining because you do need a lot of resources early on. But we will come up with much more efficient ways to collect resources that will save us a lot of time. We have a look at our production thing here again. We can see that we've got all the nickel we need, all the silicon we need. But we're still a bit low on the old iron. Okay, looks like we've got enough resources for everything to get built. So let's start grabbing them into our inventory and loading up that assembler. You can see that production of even small things like computers is quite slow from the survival kit. While those computers are getting built, let's talk a little bit about our HUD. On the left hand side of it, you've got J, X, O and L above a bunch of icons. The J icon is your helmet open and closed. Because we are in an oxygen rich environment, as you can see below the hotbar by O2 high, we don't need to worry about whether our helmet is open or closed. If the helmet is closed in an oxygen rich environment, your suit will constantly refill its oxygen supplies from the environment. If you're in an oxygen poor environment, however, you will need to have your helmet closed, otherwise you will get injured. We should have our computers almost done. Yep, they are done. Excellent, let's get this assembler constructed. There we go, one assembler done. Now let's have a look at a bit more detail of this base. Right now we've got our basic assembler, we've got our incomplete refinery, and we've got our wind turbine. Our basic assembler requires 280 kilowatts of power to function. And our wind turbine is fortunately outputting more than that at 324. That means that we will be able to run this basic assembler off that single wind turbine. That was the reason why I built it up on a bunch of blocks. If you elevate your wind turbines above the voxel material, you will actually get better power output from them. So let's prove that. Let's grab a few more armor blocks and let's grind off our wind turbine. One, two, three, four, five. Let's go six. So it was 324, let's see how it goes now. Nicely, the speed of the turbine itself actually relates to the power output. The faster those blades are spinning, the more power you're getting from it. So let's have a look now. We go to our control panel, go to our wind turbine. It's now 394, so we gained an extra 70 kilowatts from moving it up those six blocks, which is nice. If it was right down at the ground, we may not even produce enough power for this assembler to run and we'd need to have two of them. Which in the early game is a bit of a pain because that means a lot more materials when all it would have cost us was a few extra steel plates to raise that thing up. Of course, if you're trying to be stealthy, having a giant tower with a turbine on top is probably not what you're after. This next step is not necessary, but it's something I'm going to do because it helps demonstrate a few things. Let's grab our silicon, our nickel, and our iron out of our survival kit. Let's pop it into our basic assembler. Now, let's queue up what we need for this refinery to get constructed. So that's 100 steel plate, 20 construction components. So go to production, 100 steel plate, 20 construction components, 10 motors, 10 computers. 10 motors. 10 computers. 
You can see here that this basic assembler does not have the ingots production option. That's because basic assemblers can only produce components from already refined ingots. Good thing about it though, is it can also break down components and create ingots from them. So if we go to the disassembling, you'll see that we've got 13 steel plates. So we could actually break those down and then we collect iron from that. So now we've got all the iron available that it took to make those. This relationship is perfect. You will get back everything that you put in. So you can disassemble and assemble to your heart's content. The only thing it costs you is energy. So let's go back to assembling. Let's queue up another 10 steel plate because those are the ones we just disassembled. Moving the ingots from the survival kit to the assembler is an extra step that probably costs more time than the time it saves by making the components faster. But as I said, this was just purely for demonstration purposes of a way you can manage these systems, but why you want to have conveyor systems organized to move materials rather than have to do it by hand. If like me, you find yourself with components in your inventory, things like basic assemblers can actually hold some of those components. So we can dump those out and clear out a bit more space for this mining effort. And my suit is now out of power. My lights won't work and my tools won't work but I'm not getting injured. The reason for that is I'm in a very safe environment. If you look to beside where the O2 high thing is, you'll see a warm indicator. I am in a safe environment. This environment is easily comfortable for me to exist without my suit. So my suit doesn't use up much energy to warm me or cool me. If I'm in a very hot environment or if I'm in a very cold environment, my suit will use up more energy to heat or cool me and if my suit runs out of power, I will start getting injured. Now that it's nighttime and it's cold, you can see that I'm starting to become injured with my suit being out of power. And there we go. Health back, power back, and we'll be okay. So even day night cycles will make a difference in terms of your temperature. It's something to keep in mind if you're likely to run out of power at any point. So usually nice to keep a power source nearby. And that power source can either be a survival kit, a med bay, or simply a cockpit that you can jump into. So if we put our seat back in here, we can actually recharge with that as well. You can see my power is at 98. If I jump in the seat, it'll jump back up to 100. So that's another alternative way to recharge your power if you're running low. Get the last motors, the last steel plate, and then we will build ourselves a refinery. And refinery complete. If you have a look, you can access the refinery through this port but it will also, if you click show connected, allow us access to the basic assembler. That's going to be the easiest way to access both because you really do want them to connect to one another. If we didn't align them, we would actually have to manually move stuff like we were doing between the survival kit and the basic assembler, which just isn't ideal. You don't want to give yourself that extra work if you don't have to. I've just collected another load of stone to demonstrate how the basic refinery works. Unlike the survival kit, this one's got more capacity, which means we can drop the whole lot in rather than having to wait for part of it to be processed before we can drop it in. It also doesn't need anything queued up in a production queue. It will just automatically process anything that's in its processing inventory. So that's any stone or any ores. We get a similar breakdown of materials, but we also break down right to the last little bit. Unlike the survival kit, which needs 500 units at a go. So we're always left with a little bit behind. The next thing I want to do will require a bit of daylight. So let's jump ahead to when the sun has risen. On planets in Space Engineers, ores are clumped together under markings on the surface. One of the easiest ways I've figured to spot those markings is to either turn off all your grass or press V for view, go to third person, press Alt and scroll down on your mouse wheel to zoom out as far as possible. And now we can actually see a fair bit around us except for when something gets in the way of the camera. And I think I spot something in the shadow there that looks a bit like an ore deposit. And also over there on the mountain. I'll highlight these to make them a bit more obvious, but let's fly over to the one on the side of that mountain for now. What we're looking for to identify the ore deposits on Earth are these gray areas that I'm indicating with my drill tip. There's a speckled kind of gray appearance of the terrain there. There's another speckled over in the distance there. And if we head over there with our engineer and use our drill, we should be able to detect most of the ores that are underneath. We may not be able to detect all of them though. If they're too deep for our drill, we will not be able to see anything. And that's when you might want to use an ore detector that's on your ship or on something larger. 
we'll look into ore detectors next time when we go to get a more efficient way of collecting materials. For now, what I wanted to show you was how you could find materials around because pretty early on, we're going to be needing some cobalt and we can't get that just from stone. As you can see from surface height, it's quite difficult to identify where these ore patches are. You really do need to get a lot more height. When you find an ore deposit, I would strongly recommend making a GPS marker identifying where it is and what's in it. So if we press K, go to our GPS menu, click new from current position, select it and name it something useful. This one had magnesium, so we'll go MG. It had nickel and it had silicon. And that way I will know that this spot contains those so I don't need to search them again. And you can see that marker is now gonna stay on my HUD. If you're having trouble identifying the ore spots just with the third person camera, grab your hydrogen bottle, make sure your suit's nice and full, then we can fly up really high and get a much better view of things. While doing this, keep a very close eye on your hydrogen readout. The game actually only warns you when you're running low, when you're running very, very low. So this is what I've been searching for, cobalt. We need cobalt to make metal grids and we may need metal grids to make storage units on large grid. I have actually searched quite a number of deposits in order to find this. So don't be surprised if it takes you a little while to identify where it's at. And here we have cobalt, we have iron, and we have nickel. Now we can head back to base. And we are 5.3 k's away, so that's actually a fair distance to have to travel, but that's what it is. We could keep searching and hope to find somewhere nearer, but for now I'm just going to accept that I know where some cobalt is and I am happy. The respawn pod comes up with a marker for it because it's the first survival kit we have. If I didn't have that survival kit active, if I'd moved it over to my base or if I'd destroyed this pod some other way, I would need to create a GPS marker where my base is, otherwise with my sense of direction I would get lost in moments. So it's often worthwhile making a GPS marker for your base just for later reference. If you don't want that one to show up because we've got our survival pod one, you can just double click on here and it will go invisible. The other way you can do it is to click on here and click show on HUD and turn that off. So let's turn off all our other ore markers since we only want to really know where that cobalt is for now. Now we go, our HUD is much more clear. What you've learned should get you started in survival in Space Engineers. Next time we're going to take a look at how we're going to construct some storage onto this and how we're going to collect resources much more rapidly. Most likely that's going to be with a flying mining ship which we will turn our drop pod into. So there's all that and plenty more to come and I will see you then. <laughs>